We are tracking a fire burning more than 11,000 acres in Okanagan County and the damages it's leaving behind. It is a beautiful day again in the inland northwest, but I'm tracking gusty winds tonight and possible blowing dust. That and your weekend forecast is next. And runners in Coeur d'Alene set to run a marathon that will look a little bit different this year. We'll hear from people on how they're preparing to take precautions during the pandemic. Happening right now, a wildfire burning in northern Okanagan County is now in more than 11,000 acres and has destroyed more than two dozen homes. Level two and level three evacuations now in place for what's known as the Palmer Fire. Good evening and thank you for joining us for Crampton News at 5. I'm Mark Hanrahan. Welcome everyone, I'm Whitney Ward. We begin tonight as hundreds of people are being forced to evacuate because of this Palmer fire. As of this evening, we know from state DNR offices that we have lost at least 30 structures because of this fire. Also, we know that 400 crew members are there, boots on the ground, trying to get this fire under control. But as of this hour, Okanagan Emergency Management says this fire is 0% contained. So let's take a look at the evacuation orders that are in place right now. Level three evacuation are in place for Wanakut Lake Road from Washburn to Elamiham Mountain Road. It's also in place for Totes Cooley Road to Chapaca Road. This is along the Loomis Oroville Road area. So level three again means you need to get out right now. Level two evacuations also in place for Elamiham Mountain Road. That's from Ellis Barnes Road to Loomis Oroville Road. Level two means you need to be prepared to leave at a moment's notice. And again, at least 86 structures are threatened right now. Our volunteers also work from home and um, you know, help them out over the phone or on Zoom or whatever technology will help us out to get the job done. So right now, at least a dozen people are seeking help from the Red Cross because of these fires. But because of the coronavirus, it's impacting how volunteers are able to respond. Instead of being near the fire, volunteers are on the phone or taking Zoom calls to get casework done instead. One of the leaders of the Red Cross says they need volunteers now more than ever because of this pandemic. So if you are interested and able to volunteer, for more information, just go to krem.com. Well, anytime we're talking wildfires, we're also talking weather. Let's get straight to Chief Meteorologist Tom Sherry's on the Outdoor Weather Center tonight. And Tom, the big concern with wildfires, of course, is the wind. So how's that looking tonight? Well, the winds are going to are blowing right now and they're going to gust even higher as the evening goes on. We have a cool front that is headed our way, which will cool us down into the low 80s on Saturday. But uh, again, you can see some of the current winds 23 miles. These are average wind speeds now across the region out at the airport. We're at 23 mile an hour winds. We're in the teens and lower 20s as you head out towards the Columbia and Upper Columbia Basin. Uh, Keep in mind that some of these winds, especially out west of us, are going to be in excess of uh, 30 miles an hour. So blowing dust is a real possibility tonight. And of course, it also means for extremely high fire danger. These are the current temperatures. We're at 90 degrees as you head out towards Moses Lake, 88 in Ritzville, 87 degrees now in Spokane, 89 degrees over in the Lake City, and 87 degrees up in uh, Kettle Falls up in northeastern Washington. And there's a look at the satellite and the uh, imagery display, the radar, and you can see again, Wet weather west of the Cascades. That's the cool front as we zoom in on it. And it is manifesting itself here in eastern Washington, not so much with showers, but with uh, the windy conditions that we'll see throughout the evening and overnight hours, and also those cooler temperatures that we'll get on Saturday. How cool? 81 degrees will be Saturday's high after a morning low of 58. Then it warms back up into the upper 80s on Sunday under mostly sunny skies. I'll check the rest of your seven day forecast coming up in a few minutes. Sounds good, Tom. Thank you. Thank you very much. The Coeur d'Alene Marathon starts today using a much different format. It'll be spread out across three days. Participants will run a marathon of their choice or shorter distances. Organizers are taking precautions with COVID-19 this year. They made the changes. Krem 2's Amanda Rowley joins us live now from McEwen Park at the starting line with a look at how things are going so far. Amanda. Well, Mark, it's Friday, so things are obviously looking pretty good. The sun is shining. We're getting a little breeze, so thank goodness for that. Now, some runners here for the Coeur d'Alene Marathon have already started their race. You can see the clock has started. Started at about 4.30 here. Now, one of the changes that they made this year was runners will start here 
at the blue arch and then they'll finish at the green arch. You'll see some video of that here in just a minute. So organizers are expecting about 1500 runners here today and we talked to a few participants who are excited to be here and considering the number of events that have been canceled this year. Now Dina Minchi, she is running the 10K tonight and she'll start at the same time with seven other people, something she is glad organizers made possible this year. To have the experience of going across the starting line and a finish line instead of virtually where you're all by yourself. So I'm really thankful that Negative Slit came up with an idea to get us out here today. So, Do you think they're doing a good job of, of addressing those COVID restrictions that are in place? Oh yeah, they're doing excellent. Um, they already gave us everything so that when we're done we just grab water and, and head on home so no one's all in line and packed up. Now she recognizes this is much different than the thousands of runners we would see in the streets in the past years. Minchi says she even ran on the original date of Bloomsday this year. She says nothing compares to running with others and crossing through an actual finish line. I do want to point out all proceeds from today's event go to help the North Idaho Centennial Trail Foundation. This will help with maintenance and improvement to the trail. And I understand this is their 30th year anniversary and especially with COVID, a lot of folks are out using that trail. So use the trail, but they also want to make sure they're keeping it up as well. Reporting from Coeur d'Alene, Amanda Rowley, Creme 2 News. Very fun, Amanda. Thank you very much. Well, there are some terrifying posts making the rounds on social media right now. In fact, you may have seen some of them on your social media feeds already. We're talking about things like kidnappers who seem to be operating in broad daylight, just snatching kids or teenagers or young women off the streets or out of busy shopping centers right in front of other people and right here in Spokane. But we wanted to know, is that actually happening? Tonight, we verify. We went straight to the source for these claims, checking in with the Spokane Police Department. In a statement today, Spokane Police said these viral posts do not paint an accurate picture of what's happening in Spokane. SPD has looked into many of these claims, but has not found any evidence to substantiate them whatsoever. A department spokesman also told us there are isolated cases of trafficking in our community, but he says what we are not seeing is stranger to stranger abduction scenarios where people are ripped off the street and sold into slavery. Officers say here in Spokane, it's usually victims who are coerced into sex from people they know, either under the threat of violence or in exchange for drugs or money. And almost always, it is a lone individual, not an organized ring of human traffickers. The bottom line is human trafficking is real, and it is a serious problem all across the country. But no, these types of claims of human trafficking in Spokane are false. It's also important to mention several national media outlets like the New York Times and even Fox News have connected these rallies nationwide to a conspiracy theory known as QAnon. It's a very broad belief that there is an underground war at the highest levels to promote pedophiles and take down President Trump. Many legitimate organizations that fight human trafficking say these types of viral claims can actually do more harm than good. That's simply because they promote false fears and take important resources away from the real fight. We did ask the promoters of this Saturday's Save Our Children rally here in Spokane if they're affiliated with QAnon. They told us no, but said some supporters of QAnon may be at the event this weekend. <laughs> Washington State University is welcoming its newest Cougs. In today's convocation, students, faculty, and staff shared encouraging messages to help students get off to a great start. This comes as WSU, of course, is starting the semester with only online classes. We are a community of Cougs helping Cougs, and we live by that creed. This is your time and your experience, and it is up to you to mold it the way you want it to be. The school said it will be prepared to return to all in-person learning whenever it might be safe to do so.